All right, All right. welcome All right. everyone to Infer. We're an event filled with engaging discussions and lots of knowledge sharing. I'm excited to introduce you to your co-host, Hudson, our solutions architect at Quack, and Russ, CEO at Artifacts AI, and a man of many hats. I will let you both introduce yourselves. Guys, take it away. Good to see you, Russ. <clears throat> Good to see you, Hudson. Thanks for having me, and I'm excited to be part of this conference. Yeah, me as well. Um, yeah, I guess we can get into some intros before we get into uh, the more interesting material <clears throat> that you guys are uh, here to see today. Um, I can kick it off. My name is Hudson Busby. I'm a solutions architect here at Quack, um, helping customers build machine learning applications and pipelines in the Quack platform. Uh, prior to Quack, I spent seven, eight years uh, in the data engineering space, primarily with Spark and a little bit of Spark ML. Um, and yeah, excited to excited to hear um, some of the content that we have today. Cool, and I can give a quick uh, background about myself. Hi, everyone. My name is Russ Wilcox. Um, as Adi and Hudson intro me, I'm CEO of Artifacts AI. But prior to starting my startup, where we're innovating um, urban development with artificial intelligence, I've served as director of data science for a number of large CPG companies served as a data strategist for numbers of political campaigns and also have been a TEDx speaker and a guest lecturer at UCLA and Tufts University. So yeah, before we, I think, kick off our first speaker, um, just to give you guys a little bit of background on some of the talks and discussions that we're going through today. Um, so like on, I'm sure is on the minds of many people in attendance today, we'll be discussing quite a bit about large language models. Um, and I think in particular, uh, taking them to the next level. I think everybody is familiar with LLMs at this point as in, you know, played around with the chat GBT or maybe built out some kind of a simple rag model at their organization at this point. But I think a lot of the talks today will focus on really taking LLMs to that next level. Um, LLMs in production, uh, dealing with security with LLMs, gateways in LLMs, trying to manage multiple LLMs applications in the same environment. Um, yeah, we're living in a world of rapidly growing LLMs from from uh, self-contained models to open source models. And one of the great things about this conference is seeing a variety of perspective on not only the applications, but some of the things we have to be looking on the, keep our, keeping our eyes out for, for hallucinations and how to build trustworthiness with uh, LLMs. And very excited for the, the group that we have here to kick us off. And I'll let Hudson kick off the first speaker. So our first speaker today will be Shaked Zelinsky. Uh, he'll be discussing implementations and strategies for running LLMs in production. Um, you know, due to LLM resource requirements as well as latency limitations, uh, as prompts and queries kind of increase in complexity, productionalizing LLMs will become more and more challenging. And Shaked today will share some of the tools and processes that he's using today with customers to integrate LLMs successfully into application environments. Um, with that, I will introduce uh, Shaket, our first speaker. Hey, uh, thank you very much. Hope you all can hear me. Uh, let me just share my screen and we'll kick this off. All right, let's see, it said it's loading. You're seeing my screen? Yes, we can. And uh, okay. just for the uh, before you get started here, just for everybody in uh, attendance today, feel free to ask um, any questions uh, to Shaked. Um, if you want to put them in the chat, uh, we'll save some of the questions uh, for the end of the talk that we can kind of discuss with Shaked. If you guys have anything that you know is interesting to you during the talk, or you want him to clarify on. All right. So uh, thank you all very much for joining me today. Um, this talk is going to be about some key principles for running LLMs in production. And before we kick this off, let me start with uh, with something to say. Uh, I believe in magic. And, and I think that in a second or a minute from now, you'll find out that you too believe in magic. And it's actually no longer a matter of belief. Um, magic is here, it's real, and it's happening every day. And let me prove that to you. Um, so basically, if you ask me, I think generative AI today is the closest thing that we have to Harry Potter. And I mean, beside this very cool gag of, you know, this poster I generated out of nowhere within a minute, which is nothing but amazing. Um, I actually being 100% serious and, and let me show you why. If you've read the books um, or, or watched the movies, then you probably remember some of these magical artifacts, like that thing that you write prompts to and it replies to you instantly with, uh, you know, its own prompts. 
um, or these uh, images, uh, static images that become live, uh, vivid videos. Um, those things were magical. When the books were written, um, they're no longer magical. They're, this is, let's face it, this is commodity, right? I mean, everybody's using ChatGPT. Everybody knows what it is. We can all do this stuff, this stuff within minutes. Um, and so magic is real. Magic is here. And so I want you to think about my talk as kind of a um, introduction to scaling magic in production. So the thing is that, um, well, where I work for a JFrog, uh, we don't do the magic, we do the scaling and the production. And we actually know that pretty well. Um, we, last time I checked, 85% of Fortune 500 companies were uh, clients of JFrog. And that means that many, many comp companies, some of the best companies in the world trust us in managing um, their uh, and securing all their all their product and all their software development life cycle. And we, from where we stand uh, in supporting all this and having all this trust from the entire industry, we actually get a pretty good view on what the, um, what the industry needs and what the industry does and more than anything, what the industry wants and where the industry is going to. And LLM and generative AI, that's obviously where we're all going to. Um, and here are the few things that we've kind of understood and learned, and we I'd like to share with you from how we see the perspective and from our perspective of the world. Um, so I'm going to talk about three main things today. Um, first, we're going to discuss the available solutions and what is available to you when you want to kick off your LLM-based products. I want to talk about five elements to consider when you're building your LLM-based product. Um, these things you want to consider when you're just planning things or we're just kicking these things off and how to plan it correctly. And at the very end, I want to touch point on should you fine tune your model? That's a question that um, you kind of hear a lot, but uh, it might have a very um, different answer than what you think I'll have. Um, so I want to get to that at the end because it is important, especially these days. Let's begin with the available solutions. So. I'd like to, I think you can kind of um, seg segregate this thing into three different types. Uh, you have the company specific solutions, just like OpenAI and, and Mistral and, and Entropic, Cohere, and many, 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 many other companies that basically host their own models and provide it to you with an API access. Um, and that is something that uh, you can, it's the easiest thing in the world. You just sign up, you take an API key, and you start using it. The, other solution is model aggregators, which we also know as cloud service. Uh, this is the cloud providers that we have. It can be Microsoft Azure, um, AWS, for example, which uh, hosts Bedrock. Google just launched something new uh, lately. It's called a, a model garden. These are basically collectives of several models that you can just access through your cloud providers and usually hosted by your cloud provider. And there's the old school hardcore approach, which is using an open source model. Uh, you can find many of those on Hugging Face and on GitHub or Kaggle. Download those, host them on your own machines wherever you want to and just use them as you wish. Now, these available solutions, the way I see them, I kind of look at them in two different methods of, of accessing your models. The first approach is, is a model as a service approach. I mean, you don't own the model, it's somewhere else. You just talk to it uh, using an API. And the other approach is a self-hosted approach. You own your model. It's on your machine and you decide where it goes and what you're doing with it and you're not sharing it with anyone uh, for good or bad. So obviously the company specific, this is only a model as a service approach. And when you use an open source, uh, this is obviously just self-hosted. And the model aggregators, the, the cloud services are actually a pretty cool, um, both uh, best of both worlds solution because they gotta give you both. Usually, each one of the cloud providers also gives you an API access to some of the models and the ability to host some of your own models on, on the machines, which kind of give you the best of both. Um, and I usually believe that this is a great place to start with if you're just looking into uh, how to begin. But I want to keep in mind this model as service and the self-hosted approaches because this is how I'm going to look into things, and this is how I uh, segregate things from this point forward. Um, and I want to talk about five elements, the five things you want to keep in mind when you plan your um, your LLM-based product. Five things are cost, security, the infrastructure you're running on, the task you're about to perform, and the replaceability of the model. Um, and the first three things that I've mentioned, uh, the cost, the security, 
and the infrastructure. Uh, these, you know, these are nothing new. You have seen this on every every software or every product that you've ever launched. You've taken those things under consideration, how much it costs you, how secure it is, and where exactly is it running. The task and the replaceability are two new things that you should consider when you're running an LLM-based product. We're going to touch them at the very end. Replaceability will surprise you. And please keep uh, this one in mind. We're going to talk about this a lot. Let's begin with the, um, with the three easy one, the cost, security, and the infrastructure, and look at how each method from the one that I've just presented um, compare. So let's begin with the costs. Um, the thing is that when you look at the cost, it's not comparing is not very straightforward. When you go with the model as a service, the API approach, um, costs are calculated per token. Uh, it kind of pays you go. You use tokens, you pay for them. The problem here is that uh, how much text fits into uh, an N amount of tokens, that is not always a very intuitive calculation. And, and here's an example from GPT, for example. Um, hello world with the exclamation mark at the end, that's three tokens. You translate this to Hebrew, you get 11 tokens, even though there are only 10 characters here. Um, these four asterisks here, this is one token, but the four curly braces are two tokens. Why? Because that's what GPT decided. Um, so kind of figuring out in advance exactly how many tokens you're gonna use, not always straightforward. A uh, rule of thumb is like taking the number of words you have in English and at, add 30%. But again, calculation can get a little bit complicated and sometimes um, the, co the cost might surprise you. On the other hand, when you go with the self-hosted approach, um, it is the most straightforward you can think. I mean, um, costs are computed simply per machine uptime. Machine is up, you're paying for it. Machine is down, you're not paying for it. And while easy as it sounds, in many cases, this is still far more expensive than the pay-as-you-go approach, which is why we usually go with this thing when we start taking something off. Um, Self-hosting uh, an LLM is highly expensive. It requires a lot of GPUs power, and we haven't even talked about fine-tuning it, but just running it requires a lot, a lot of compute power and, and, and expensive compute power because we need, um, we need GPUs for that. So hosting this thing yourself is not, uh, is not cheap. So in many, many cases, you actually want to go with the model of the service approach. Moving on to security, which is super important. Uh, actually, both methods have their own major downfalls. Uh, when you go with the model as a service approach, traffic usually leaves the company clusters. Unless, of course, you're using something from your own cloud providers, which is the best probably you can do in this case. In any other case, traffic leaves the company clusters, um, which is a big problem because you're usually unable to use any private or sensitive data when you do that. Um, and in core products, that is something vital. Uh, so you need to consider that when you're using a model as a service approach, not hosted on your cloud service. On the other hand, when you go with a self-hosted approach, um, it needs to be protected just like any other company service because it's, well, it's just another service that you now own and you need to take this under consideration. It's another thing you need to secure and you need to understand how it works and where can it, uh, uh, no, what's the failures of it? Also, which is super critical because many people seem to overlook this, open source models might contain malicious codes. Um, and I'm not just saying this just to warn you, this is a real thing. Uh, here's an article just published just this month at the beginning of, of March, which Hugging Face, which is the number one repository for LLM models, uh, had a lot of uh, models with uh, backward uh, code and malicious code in it. And you, you need to scan this thing. You need to make sure that you use a provider that allows you to scan the model that you're using and, and check them the way they should and not just take anything from granted from the web because you never know what's in there. And I'm going to talk in, in just a few more slides about exactly how many models you can find on Hugging Face and you're going to be dazzled by the number. So you really, really, really want to make sure that whatever it is you're placing into your system, no matter where you take it from, um, you have a service that verifies that you don't have any malicious thing running on your systems. And moving on to infrastructure, which is the last thing from the three um, intuitive things that we've talked about before, the one in blue, this is probably the key difference between these two methods. Um, when you go with the model as a service approach, the thing you need to consider more than anything is the networking. Because the model is not part of your system, it's, it's somewhere else on different clusters, sometimes on different regions, uh, networking is actually something that um, can add up a lot of latency because every request you're making 
has its own latency to these servers. Now, let's face it, uh, LLMs, specifically the sophisticated LLMs like GPT-4, are kind of slow. So add to that the latency, and especially if you're going with chains, meaning you have several prompts going in and out before the user gets its response, this, the latency here can be a significant issue. So you need to take this under consideration and make sure that this thing uh, uh, fits into your needs. Also, what people tend to forget is that every model of the service has a rate limit. It has some capping, either by the number of tokens that you can use per minute or the number of requests that you can uh, make per minute. And as your service scale up, you can easily hit this rate limit. So you need to make sure that you're not anywhere, not anywhere close to it so when you users start using, when you add the, this, uh, um, when the service scale up, you won't be affected by it because this will simply shut down your service until the rate limit exceeds, uh, um, is, is back to normal. So this is two things you have to consider when you're using this approach. On the other hand, when you go with the self-hosted, um, the model cluster needs to be constantly monitored. And, and when you do it for the first time, this is not always trivial, again, you have a lot of GPUs for this thing. A lot of computation power needs to be taken under consideration. GPUs are expensive. Um, so making sure that this thing is monitored is not always intuitive and not always straightforward. Also, and highly important, sometimes people tend to forget this, model artifacts, if you have your own models, they need to be saved somewhere. Now, models are you know, big chunks of code. These are huge, gigabytes of code. They need to be saved somewhere. They need to be transferred in your system to the nodes that's going to run it. Um, where is it located? How is it being transferred? Um, if you're using, for example, uh, a mixture of experts, how do you plan to distribute this? These are a lot of things that you need to take under consideration when you're planning on hosting your own model, and they're not very intuitive, uh, especially not when you're just kicking this thing off. So you want to take all these things under consideration when you're planning uh, your first product on LLMs. Now, I've said a lot of things, so I want to do a quick checkpoint just to make sure that uh, uh, we're all on board. So I've talked about the costs and, and the pay-as-you-go versus uh, just paying for machines, and I've talked about the security of this thing and the infrastructure, which is the main difference. And we're left with talking about the task and how that affects the LLM that you're about to, to, to choose and the replaceability of the model. So far, so good. Yes, you're in the back. Uh, I can see the question over there. Yes, quality. I forgot to mention quality. Um, so I didn't forget to mention quality. And while we're at it, and thank you very much for the question, um, I want to say something about that. Um, so it, it reminds me of this ver um, this phrase I heard. I thought it was Einstein who said that. Apparently, it's not. Um, if you judge a fish by, uh, by its ability to climb a tree, it will live its whole life believing that it was really stupid. Now, the thing is here. LLMs are very, very different and are capable of many things. And they are very much different from any other thing that we had so far pre-generative AI era. For example, when you had just model uh, det uh, object detection, we know what the models are trying to do. When we have recommendation systems, we know what the models are trying to do. What exactly is the task that an LLM is trying to solve? Just creates text. What, what, what exactly, how are we measuring this thing? Which means that if we not just have very much different LLMs from different uh, um, from different companies, we don't really know what exactly it is we're assessing. I mean, we're assessing the, its ability to create text. We're assessing its ability to to what to do math. What are we trying to judge exactly? And that that has a lot of impact because think about your LLM. You're taking an LLM off the shelf and you're trying to use it for something. Um, if you go and you're trying to say create an, a virtual psychologist. Then you want your LLM to have empathy. You want it to have built it to make good reasoning. You want it to know social sciences so it can use it when it, you know, on, on, on your app. But if you're taking the same LLM and you're trying to create a, a virtual software engineer, for example, you want it to know math. You want it to know coding. You want it to know software engineer, software engineering. Um, these are completely different uh, uh, attributes that you want your model to know and perform. So how can we assess a single model? Uh, when it comes to all the things that it can do, which is why I believe that you know uh, things like benchmarks, like MLUs, they are nice to have, but this is not how you should judge a model. You should really try and find which model fits your needs in the best way possible. And we want you to remember that assessing LLM solely on benchmark is simply like hiring based solely on IQ. Now that sounds great in theory, 
none of us would like to work in that place. Um, so keep that in mind. Um, I'm going to read the Q&A for a second. I'll answer that in a second. So that leads me to talking about tasks. Um, not all models were created in the same way and not for the same purposes. And you really should try and find the one that fits your task in the best way. Few technical things you want to remember when you assess a model. Um, first of all, size. I mean, size do matter, and models come in different sizes. Now, we sometimes have this uh, uh, ambition to just use the biggest model out there because that's the coolest thing there is, and it's probably doing the best. Not always. Um, that 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 basically think about model size as exchanging speed for sophistication. If you're using some, if your task is trivial in many ways. You can use a smaller model. Smaller models are easier to maintain. They are faster, much faster, and they are also cheaper. So don't always go with the biggest you have because sometimes you're just you know, adding latency, which you don't need, and costs. Function calling, which is personally my favorite thing in LLMs. Uh, sometimes you know this is agents. If you use Langchain, if you probably use AutoGPT, you know that too. Uh, function callings are basically some, think about as some fine tuning that LLMs are going through to allow them to use external tools in a better way. You basically define a set of tools that the uh, model can use, and it just uses them as it tries to uh, complete its assignment. For example, asking uh, querying databases, for example, or searching the web, or you know, reading documentation of some internal product. These can all be uh, tools that the, uh, the LLM can search in, and thus can be a great thing to use um, and lower the, the, the overload from the model itself. Also, language. Um, which language are you using? Do you need only English or do you require more languages? Um, are you using your model for coding purposes? Each one of these things have its own different models. Using just English, you can use a smaller model. Using it for coding, there are models specifically for coding. Just use them. Then we ha you'll have something that is more tuned for your task and, again, usually smaller and more effective. So you want to take this under consideration when you're choosing the best model for you. Which takes me to the last thing from the five elements. And if I've lost you somewhere along the way, this is a time to come back because if there's anything, anything that I want you to take away from this, um, this will be it. So pay attention to this. Replacing models. The pace in which LLMs meet the market is nothing like we've never seen before. Um, now you know that, but let me just show you exactly what I mean. Um, this um, this graph was taken from the Mistral website just last month when they released Mistral Large. Uh, they made a comparison between their new model and all the uh, leading models at that point. And if you notice anything except GPT 3.5 here, each one of these models were released in the last year. The last 12 months, all of these models were released. Um, and if you kind of wonder where Claude 3 is, it's not here because Claude 3 was released after Mistral Large, and this thing just happened last month. So this is the pace in which we get new models into the market, and they're just getting better and better and better. Um, also, is a, a fun trivia fact. Um, some students from Stanford on July 2023 tried to find some uh, links between different LLMs and connection between LLMs on Hugging Face, which is the number one repository for LLMs. And on July 2023, there were no almost 16,000 different LLMs on Hugging Face. And that was, again, almost six months ago. Um, that is a lot. That's a lot, a lot of models, and the numbers just keep on growing. So there are a lot of models out there, uh, and, the, and there's always better one every time there's another one coming in. So I want you to remember that no matter how good your LLM is, and no matter how good you think your LLM is, there will be a better one in six months. Guaranteed, no matter what it is you do, this is just the pace in which things are moving at. Um, and so I want you to keep that in mind. And with that in mind, I think that the pace dictates a whole new mythology when you're using LLMs as a core product. And that is you want to be as loosely dependent on a certain model as possible. And you want to be able to test and replace models when the better variation, when a better variation arrives, because it will. And this is the one, the, if there's anything I want you to take away from what I'm saying right now, this is the slide. You want to be as loosely dependent on a certain model as possible, because in six months and in 12 months for sure, there will be a model performing better than the one that you're having currently in production, no matter 
if it is the state of the art or not. Um, and that can easily become the weakest link of your product in six months from now or 12 months from now. And if you want to keep your product up and running, you want to be able to adjust and adapt to new models as they come in. Um, that's a lot. So um, I said a lot of things. And before we touch on the fine tuning thing, which is important nonetheless, I want to give you um, four questions you want to ask yourself when you plan your LLM based product and take everything under consideration. Number one, you want to ask yourself how often will this product be used? Because that affects the payment method and how much money it's going to cost you. And it affects the latency and rate limit consideration. Because the more often this, mod this product is going to be used, you probably need lower latency and higher rate limits. Um, you want to consider if there's any sensitive data that is being involved in it. Because if there is, then you probably need to host something on your own environment, like your own cloud service. And if you do, you need to think about um, where you keep the artifacts. You want to consider the model size because it has a lot of impact on it. And you want to consider if it is open source or closed source. I mean, can you store it anywhere? Or you have to store it, for example, on OpenAI servers. And last thing is how easy will it be to replace the model when the time comes? Because again, the time will come and it will come faster than you think. Um, so here's a comparison. Just kind of a, if there's a, a comparison slide you can take away and, and have, you know, just look at whenever you want. Uh, so when you go to the model as a service approach, it's a pay-as-you-go because it's an API access. It's usually is external to your system unless you're using your own cloud provider. If you're not using your cloud provider, you can't use sensitive data because traffic lives your system. Um, and it's very easy to launch and very easy to replace because it's literally just plug and play. When you go with the self-hosted uh, approach, it's the old school, the old school cost. You can just compute it you know, by how much uh, computation power you're using. And um, it's always a part of the system. And sensitive data can be used because it is a part of the system. Also, which is one of the down parts here, deployment and maintenance are much, much, much more complex. Um, so bottom line here, you want to use the model as a service when you're going for experimental features and minor features. If you want to just test something, you want to just get up and running and just see if it works, you go with the API, the model as a service, because it's just super fast to implement. You want to go with the self-hosted when you get to the point that this feature is now a core product or a primary feature. So you want to make sure that no matter what happens, rate limits don't affect you, that latency is the lowest you can. You can use sensitive data, and it's your own resources. You get to this point when you are absolutely sure that this is a core product that you want to use, and this is a primary feature that you really need to make sure that nobody else can affect, nothing in the network can affect. Um, and so this is the one thing, this is like the comparison you can keep in mind when you think about how you want to do it. You usually start with the model of service and you move on to self-hosted when and you need it. So I want to talk about fine tuning before I uh, finish here. Should you fine tune your model? Uh, it's a question I get a lot. And well, if you want to skip the next five minutes, here's my answer. Um, you probably shouldn't, certainly not yet. And if you don't want to skip the next five minutes and, and hear me out to why, here's my take on this. Um, Fine-tuning model can be an exhaustive process and expensive. And I want to emphasize on what? Because it sounds simple. It sounds uh, Fine-tuning is is done. It, it sounds like a simple thing because here are just a few JSON lines that are uh, using as data. Just feed it to the model, wait a few hours, and it's ready. If you're, you're doing it, let's say, on, on OpenAI or stuff like that. Getting the right data is 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 crucial because the models are so um, sensitive to the data that you feed them. They can actually forget things they know and just learn new stuff. Um, getting the right data and fine cleaning it and, and getting it in, in the right amount is can be an exhaustive process and take usually several iteration. And again, this thing is expensive, not just because of the manpower, because again, fine tuning on GPUs, that's an expensive process. So you really need to take this under consideration because in many, many, many cases, it's simply unnecessary. Um, also, if we go back to the model replaceability thing that I've discussed, um, a fine-tuned model is harder to replace because it's a fine-tuned model. It's not something out of the box. Um, and that can easily become the weakest link of your product. And you should consider that when you're thinking long-term on your product. So when you shouldn't, when shouldn't you fine-tune your model? You shouldn't 
fine tune your model when you want simply want the model to teach it to know and be familiar with new data. Um, there are other methods to handle this case. For example, prompt engineering. Now, I know the prompt engineering sounds like you know um, um, I'm making this thing up. It's like yeah, it's not really uh, it's not really compute not real uh, software engineering. That's actually not true. There are many 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 um, papers that are showing that LMs are actually doing much better when you simply prompt engineering in a good way, because this is how attention works. You can also use RUG, uh, Response Augmented Generation, which is a, a method of using embeddings to get uh, sections of text into the model and allow it to focus on what it should, uh, on these te on texts to answer. Um, you can use function calling, which is Personally, one of my favorite approach because you can you simply connect your LLM to another um, another data source like your APIs or documentations, and instead of teaching it its model, it can simply retrieve the model from your internal um, from your internal tools. And post processing sometimes it's easier to get the model to do something like just half the task and finish the other half yourself uh, with some post processing. So. Usually, I personally uh, take all of these four combined. I think this is the best way of doing things. And in many, many cases, this, in my perspective, in all cases, this replaces fine tuning when you just want your model to know new data. Um, but sometimes you do. Sometimes you do find, need to fine tune your model. And that happens usually when, in my, of course, my opinion, when you simply want to alter the way the model responds or simply how it understands data. I mean, you want to change the behavior of how the model acts. Um, and this is when you should consider fine tuning. And yet, even if you're going in this direction, try everything I've just said before. It's cheaper, it's faster. And you know, I think it, it gets you at least somewhere. Um, I personally recommend on trying everything before you're going to fine tune a model. Think of it as a last resort. If nothing assisted, if you could not find the model that does what you need. If you none of the methods that I've mentioned can get you to where I want, then you should consider fine-tuning your model and only then. Do not fine-tune your model because you know all the cool guys are fine-tuning your models. That, that, that's not how it works. Um, so keep that in mind when you uh, discuss fine-tuning and, and models. Let me summarize everything I've said because I've said a lot of things. Um, so first of all, I'm going to go back to, what I, to how I started. LNMs are divided into three main groups and two main, two main methods. The model as a service or the shared um, resources and the self-hosted approach, which is simply yours and nobody else can touch it. Um, model as a service usually fits better with experimental features and less important features as it goes. It allows fast launches. This is why we usually start with it because it's just easy. It's super, super, super easy. Self-hosted models are the old school approach, but it just gets tougher. Um, when it comes to LLMs. And so it fits better when you're talking about products that have been tested and there are core products and you know that just using the, uh, the you don't make, want to make sure that no rate limits and nothing can affect your models. It's only yours. Um, the pace in which new state-of-the-art models are released is dazzling. And so you want to make sure that you can ex uh, quickly experiment and replace your LLMs um, because that is, in my perspective, a key to the longevity of the product. And uh, fine-tuning your models, uh, while it has its own unique benefits, uh, this is an expensive approach. And in many, 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 many cases, it is completely unnecessary in my perspective, of course, in my personal opinion. That was a really great intro to LLMs and the vast rate at which they're growing. One of the questions that I have is, with all of these different models coming out and these updates for someone who's just starting or even someone who's well acquainted with LLMs, what process do you go through when determining what the best model is for you and your task? Oh, that's a, that's a great question. Um, so I think the way I look at it is first of all, um, I try to see like how, how good can I perform with the best model? So I try to see if I can, Use GPT-4 or you know Cloud-3 to see how well does the best LLM perform on a specific task, and that's kind of set the bar. Okay, if this, if I can't do that, if even GPT, for example, can't do that, then um, I know that I need to uh, think of a different thing or maybe fine-tune a model or something like this. If I know that GPT and and Cloud can do that, I try to lower the bar and see. Okay, let's take let's take a, a smaller model, let's take a, a, um, an open source model and see. Where does the bar fit um, and where can I start? What's the smallest model and the best model I can use for this case? 
Okay. Awesome. Interesting. Um, yeah, Shaket, thank you for that. That was a, a really great kind of comprehensive uh, overview of LLMs. Um, you know, I, one thing that kind of I was thinking about during this, um, you know, obviously the benefits of using a managed service, um, being able to run multiple applications at the same time. I think a lot of organizations right now are kind of grappling with just their first LLM application or maybe their first two use cases. But I think going more towards the self-hosted side of things, um, as the number of LLM applications increase and you know each task has its own specific use cases or uh, specific requirements, heavier latency requirements, more throughput, how do you go about deciding kind of the, you know, the web of different LLM applications that you're hosting in a self-hosted environment? Are you hosting one large LLM that's servicing 10 different application use cases? Do you have kind of a mix of different LLM applications in a cluster in however you're deploying these services? Um, and how do you go about deciding that? Because it's, it's a lot of variables to kind of think about and go through um, that I think could be overwhelming for a lot of organizations or engineers. Uh, absolutely. Um, it's, it's, a, it's a fascinating question. Um, I think you first of all want to start if you need to think about uh, planning ahead. If you know that you're about to have just one main one main uh, product based on LLMs and you should consider, and you got to the point where you need to self-host it yourself, go ahead and do it. If you already know at this point, we're just starting that you have many features that are going to rely on LLMs and you plan on self-hosting each and every one a different model, probably not. It's going to be very expensive and this is student how you begin. If you already know you have different, many, many different features you want to start, start with the model as a service. Try to take the load off your system because, um, you know, maintaining all of that stuff, uh, that's a lot of work. Really, I really think you need to self-host your own model when you get to the point where this is such a core feature that you really can't lose it. You cannot be dependent on anything but uh, but yourself. And this is when you should consider self-hosting. Yeah, that makes sense as a, I think, just general workflow. Start with like kind of the managed service. And if it's not able, I guess, to meet the specific use case needs, maybe going into a more fine-tuned use case. Kind of on that note, you also mentioned the importance of you know, not judging the LLMs by the um, <clears throat> the efficiency tests or the the more like published tests that you see on Hugging Face or Twitter. Um, and that kind of, I don't know, makes me think that it seems like, you know, for if you're an organization that you're kind of doing your own custom testing for each LLM that comes out on the specific use case. I was wondering if you know of any tools or frameworks out there for managing, I guess, industry or use case specific prompt templates. Um, that people can use to evaluate LLMs. So that way they can kind of, you know, help select the um, more specific LLM for their use case instead of looking at the overall testing methodology. Yeah, so I think we're starting to get there because, um, you know, I, I see a lot of people trying to, starting to look at prompts as the, the new software. I mean, the, the new programming language is English because this is uh, what prompts are now. Um, I know there are there are several open source um, frameworks. I know there's one by Langchain. I don't remember the exactly Lang what, but something from Langchain that is actually doing just this. And there are many, many, many others. Um, keeping track of prompts is crucial. Um, and the thing that is really is important to remember, it's also depending on the specific LLM that you're using. I mean, no matter how well your prompt is doing on, say, GPT, you uh, if GPT had its version. Uh, uh, the version bump, you don't know it, and your prompt is now doing something different. Um, if you just move to Claude or anything else, your prompt will do something different. And above everything, you have to remember that as long as you keep the temperature not zero or anything like that, then it doesn't matter how well your prompt is, you're going to get different responses. So um, just keeping in mind, you know, and keeping track of prompts, that is an important thing. But I think that sometimes when you... Um, just have that in mind, you kind of miss a lot of other things that you should take into consideration when you are talking to a model. Yeah, that makes sense. Yeah, definitely. Um, one us. question that I have, since you said that uh, prompt engineering is the new software engineering, we have lots of tools like GitHub, um, GitLab, all that stuff for version control. How do you go about version controlling your prompts? That's yeah. that's amazing question. Um, I think most of us don't really know yet. 
um, because we don't always know even how little changes might affect the prompt. I mean, think about it, eventually how things happen is that um, the prompts are, you know, all the tokens are being, you know, used for the attention. What happens if you add extra space or just another new line uh, between words that can actually affect the outcome of the prompt? Uh, if you just, you wrote something in, in all uh, upper cases instead of just, you know, the normal, all of these things have impacts. Um, by the way, you can check it out in GPT if you use the word yes uh, in all caps law in like uh, uppercase or yes in capitalize or yes in lowercase, it has different tokens. Specifically, yes, it's even if it's located in different locations in the sentence has different tokens, meaning each one of these changes, even though that for us um, seems that has no meaning, uh, has a lot of meaning to the prompt that happens at the back. And and so maybe, you know, thinking about English as a new programming language, uh, we should take this, you know, with a grain of salt because you, it's not real English. It's how the models interpret this English, um, which is an important thing to remember. Um, hopefully that answered the question. Yeah, it's really, it's really interesting to think of, um, you know, like I think you you pointed this out in your, in your uh, presentation that um, just you know, how prompt engineering comes off as, you know, not software engineering or, you know, like magic effectively, yeah. but really um, it's it the prompt themselves, the templates that you create for each use case are really application environments. Like we'll, we'll start to think of them the same way as a container or as a PIP environment, because they're um, that's significant to the outcome of your LLMs and the responses. Um, we can go to uh Thank you for answering our questions. Also, we can go to a few of the questions uh, in the chat if you'd like. Um, yeah. uh, we have one um, from Kalyan. Uh, apologies if I uh, butcher your name here. Uh, what are your recommendations for model artifact management um, in general for classical models? Um, not sure I understand the question. Um... Guessing in the sense of self-hosted, just um, maybe, maybe for classical model and pre-generative AI, maybe, maybe just uh, probably um, using general open source LLMs like using a llama or something like that. What are you using for um, the actual management of the model artifacts in a self-hosted way? Obviously, I'm biased here. I'm going to say JFrog. I mean, we use the Artifactory um, to keep your models. That will be my obvious answer for this. Um, but yeah, you can use like any, um, I mean, personally, I can tell you when we used to work, I used to work uh, at Tabula. This is where we, this is how we store the models. All models were eventually on, on Artifactory and this is how we use them. So I'm I'm, I'm biased toward JFrog even before I worked at JFrog. So yes, this is probably where you want to keep it. Makes sense. Yeah. And I think even beyond that, just getting into different layers of metadata management, which yeah, a tool like JFrog is fantastic for that. Um, and I think a lot of teams and organizations are starting to think about that in a more um, traditional software engineering approach way. Um, yeah. We have another question here. Um, what do you think about using adapter-based fine-tuning for different tasks while keeping the model's main weights unchanged and loading adapters dynamically for specific tasks? So a bit more on the fine-tuning side here. Um, what do I think about adapter-based? Um... It's a great question. I personally haven't done that myself, so I don't know. Like, um, I haven't implemented it myself the adapter-based fine tuning. Um, but as far as I know, doing pretty good work. Uh, so I don't really have my own personal opinion on this. Um, so. Yeah, I can jump into that a little bit. I've done a lot sure. of work with uh, adapter layers. So you have to remember the idea behind the adapter layer is it kind of functions as two ways. It functions as a quantization of your embeddings at some point where you're squishing them into the right vector space. And then the thing that I'm cognizant of when you're any, anytime you're doing fine tuning with the layers is thinking about the out of vocabulary tokens, right? Because that's where the power comes from, right? So if you look at your standard transformer architecture, you're initializing with a set of base embeddings. Now your base language model might have something in um, the domain that you're looking for and those embeddings are good, but then you'll have a lot of out of vocabulary terms that are essentially randomly initialized as vectors. So if you just try to fine tune, they, they learn at different rates. So the whole idea of putting the adapter layer in there is to be able to essentially quantize them so that they're learning at the same rate. So um, when you're looking at fine tuning specifically, I would say do an analysis out of, of your out of distribution terms. If you have a high level of out of vocabulary terms, that's a good indicator that you will want to. Yeah. 
yeah. use um, an adapter layer approach. If you don't, and you're just trying to improve context, then I'd ask the question, do I really want to fine tune or do I want to ragify? Yeah. And personally, I'm just going to just mention quantization as part of this. I really want to say that I think quantization is, is where things are going to because it's performing amazingly well. I mean, the first that I have at home, um, uh, an Apple, I, uh, a Mac i5, you know, an ideal i5 from like six years ago and I can run Gemma 2 on that's uh, using quantization. That's that's an amazing thing. And I think that this is a direction where we're going to see the entire industry going to because we can do it. We can lower um, the, the, the size of these models and run them on really small um, and, and old computers, which is amazing because this solves a lot of issues um, in terms of models because they're, the main problem here is they're just simply huge. Awesome. Well, Shaked, thank you so much for your time and your experience um, getting us kicked off with the, these large language models. Yeah.